as you can see on this graph, it depicts both the um, increase in value and also the risk through the vari variations in value over time. Next, we're going to turn to a different way to capture risk and return. So this graph shows the, the increase in value. Uh, we also know that we can compute year-to-year -year return. So if we compute year-to-year -year return, over this time period from 1925 to 1911, we have over eight, we have 86 years worth of return. So it's very hard to grasp 86 numbers all at once. So what we do is we present, um, we need to find a way to summarize that information. And the way we do that is through summary statistics. The first of the summary statistics, so in this graph is, is, is clear, um, that the, the potential in, increase in value, in other words, the return for a small company stock is the largest, $15,000, compared to any other forms of investment. It also has a higher risk because you can see the, vari the variability of this line for small company stocks is much more jagged than the variability for the large company stocks and significantly more so than T-views. So how do we capture that information is our next objective. We want to capture the information in a way that is much easier to use instead of just a, um, a graph. So the first summary statistics is the arithmetic average. So in here, the way we compute the average return is we compute the return each year for the past 76 years. And then we compute, and then we average those return. So over the entire time, entire time period, the average return per year from investing in large stock is 11.8 or almost 12 percent. For small stock is 16.5 percent. Uh, this is corporate bond, government bond, and T bill, which is the short term investment of three months to nine months a year, is 3.6 percent. So this is actually consistent with what we have seen in the graph as well, that the highest return is from investing in small stock and followed by large stocks, followed by bonds. And then the short term invest, uh, instrument is the uh, give you the lowest return. In fact, it actually just keep up with inflation. So, so investing in the low risk investment of US T bill is still better than putting your money under the mattress because if you put your money under the mattress, your money will lose its purchasing power because inflation is 3.1%. If you invest in US T bill, at least you're keeping up with inflation. Now that we have information about return, we want to then also capture the risk of the element of risk. So you know to uh, one way to look at return versus risk is to look at um, now to contrast um, how much you get from investing in something that is risky versus if you invest in something that is safe. As we see, we said earlier that putting your money un under the mattress is actually not very safe because of inflation. If you put your money under the mattress, you're going to guarantee to lose because inflation is uh, almost three on average three percent. It has been small uh, lower in recent years, but it's still positive. So uh, a guarantee loss is not a very good thing. Uh, so what we want to do is look at if you don't put your money under the mattress, what is the next safest investment you can get? Um, ideally, we want to find something that is truly risk-free, but that does not exist. The safest investment that we have encountered is the UST bill. So what, what we oftentimes do is we use the UST bill as a proxy for the risk-free rate. So once we have a proxy for the risk-free return, then we can look at our relative return, meaning how much more we are getting over and above this baseline. So again, the uh, the risk-free return is a baseline that we want that we want to use as a comparison to higher risk investments. We call that extra return that we get from investing in risky investment, risk premium. So we can compute risk premium 
us the difference between the return we get on those risky asset risky investments compared to the risk-free rate so rf here stands for risk-free rate um, as we stated earlier we don't really have risk-free investment in the real world so the closest we have is a proxy and we use tbill as the proxy so we can compute the risk premium for um, the investments over time So if you take a look at what we have seen earlier, the historic risk premium, since the last stock has a return of 11.8% and T-bills return is 3.6%, the risk premium for last stock was 8.2%. So if we buy stocks, large stocks, we get 8.2% over and above the risk-free rate. Uh, the same is true for the small stock. Um, Again, we are always comparing it to the risk-free return. So this is the risk premium for small stock is 12.9%. And the same is true for government bond and for um, corporate bonds. So now let's think about, well, why would different investment have different risk premium? At the very beginning, we said that there has to be a trade-off. There's a trade-off between risk and return. So what we, we already saw in the graph that small stock has, high, has the highest risk and give us the highest return and the highest risk premium. And government bond has relatively lower risk and it give us a lower return and a lower risk premium. The next step is to capture the risk component of our return. The sample statistics that we use to, to capture risk is standard deviation. And in order to compute standard deviation, we first have to compute variance. So those two sample statistics, standard deviation and variance, measure the volatility of the asset return. So this is a uh, quantitative way to capture risk um, as an alternative to looking at how much the line uh, varies or ja how jagged the line is on a graph. So the greater the volatility, the greater the, the larger the standard deviation, the larger the variance, the greater the risk or uncertainty associated with the investment. So in order to compute variance and standard deviation, we need the following. We need the arithmetic average. So an arithmetic average is simply the sum of all the annual returns divided by the number of observations and also the variance. So this is a symbol for variance. The variance is defined as the deviation or the square deviation. So we take the return for each year, subtract the average from that year's return, square that deviation. And we add up all these square deviation and it be divided by not just the number of observations, but the number of observations subtract by one. The reason we have to subtract one is because this is a sample variance and we have used up one degree of freedom when we compute the arithmetic average. And then the last step is to compute the standard deviation. The standard deviation is just the square root of the variance. We're going to go over an example. And in the example, we're going to compute the arithmetic average, the variance, and the standard deviation. In this example, we have three years worth of return. So in the first step, we're going to compute the arithmetic average. So to compute the arithmetic average, we'll add up the numbers. So we'll add 8% plus negative 6% plus 10%. So that gives us um, 12%. And we need to divide that by the number of observations. And we have three years, so we'll divide that by three, and that will give us our average. So our arithmetic average is the sum of 0 0.08 minus 0 0.06 plus 0 0.1 divided by three. That is the total in the top is 0 0.12 divided by three is 0 0.04. So our arithmetic average is 4%. Now that we have our arithmetic average, next we can compute these variance. To compute the variance, we have to compute the deviation for each year and then square that deviation and add up the total. So let me go over step by step how do we get that. 
So we have to start one year at a time. So let's start with year one. Year one, our return is 8%. So we have 8%. We have to subtract the average. The average is 4%. And then we square this difference. So this is the square, this is called a deviation, and we square the deviation. Next, we move on to year two. Year two, our return is negative 6%. So that's minus 0 0.06. And we subtract from it our average, which is 0 0.04. And once again, we square this difference. And then lastly, in year three, the return is 10%. So we take 10%, subtract once again the average, which is 4%, and we square this difference. So we have all three years. Now we have to divide this by not three, but three minus one. So we have to do, divide this by two. So the numerator turns out to be 0.0152. And the numerator, of course, is 2. So our variance is 0 0.0076. And the standard deviation is simply the square root of the variance. So to compute the standard deviation, we take the variance and or the square root of the variance. And that turns out to be 0 0.0872. So our, very, our standard deviation is 8.72%. And here I want to point out something important. When we are computing the average, so this is the average return of the mean return, we can express that number as a percentage. So the average return for this stock over the three years is 4%. The standard deviation can also be expressed as a percentage. The standard deviation for this stock is 8.72%. The variance, however, does, is not a percentage, so you cannot convert the variance into a percentage.